So today's episode, what are we talking about, Wayne? <laughs> Semi-automatic hunting platforms, a.k.a. the AR-15. We're not going to talk about AR-10s. I don't care about them. <laughs> yeah, they're a bit much. A di- dino boy will tell you that they don't, they don't last. But it, uh, it seems as if, especially since thermal's been getting cheaper and cheaper yep. and better, that it is getting more and more popular for the AR-15 platform. So we're going to do this podcast to caveat to our next podcast, but, uh, going off the cuff here, I'm not, uh, not reading off notes. We're just going to talk about semi-automatic AR-15 specifically for predator hunting. And I guess hog hunting will throw that in the category. Cause a lot of people dual purpose that situation. John is typically my go-to on high quality AR platform stuff. Just by Novaski. I, I, I sim for Novaski. Uh, he's in the know on like your higher quality parts, your, your better parts, I guess is what you'd say. And like I said, I'm not going off notes this time, but I'm going to kind of break it down. Like either, uh, building your own, buying your own or buying a custom. Yeah. Like, well, deal. before we get into that, I want to talk about, uh, you stirred up some drama this last week I didn't stir on, up nothing. on the Instagrams <laughs> with, your, with your opinions that you have. Uh, I mean, who the fuck are you? Oh, sorry, cuss word. Jesus. Who are you to be out there spreading uh, disinformation? Number one, that's factually incorrect. So we, In my opinion. Uh, I guess we would have posted this reel because I probably stirred this up. Um, and I think it would be good for us to elaborate it on it just a minute. Yeah. You know, give us give it some more context. You posted a reel talking about, uh, first of all, we uh, we at the TPH podcast absolutely hate and despise the, the caliber known as 308. <laughs> I get it. It works. It works as good as it always has, but there are things that are so much better now. And a lot of the advantages to it have kind of ran out. Yeah. So we posted a reel. Hang on. There is an exception to everything. If you're shooting in very brushy environments, hunting out to 200 yards. With 110 grain being yeah. max on coats. Yeah. This is my very small, narrow exception past that I don't like it at all. Yeah. <laughs> and that's not to say like, Okay, let's let's we'll talk about exactly what you said first. You you essentially stated well, we're talking about three oh eights for because everybody's like, oh, you want to learn long range, get a three oh eight. Well, okay, let's just back it up even more. Okay, how we come up with reels? One, we want to, as far as munitions reels goes, we want to be informative. We want to, you know, well, there's there's two things. One, we want to we want to try to educate or share our opinions on things. Yeah. Uh, but two, we also kind of want to probe and see what people are interested in, and it helps us come up with topics with podcasts or other content we do. So we kind of like, you know, we're throwing the net out there. Yeah. We're, we're trolling a so little bit. John comes to me and is like, these people, <laughs> these people over on well, just what, what, yeah, whatever internet yeah, or yeah. Instagram, uh, just there's the come thing on the internet is if you get a 308, um, <laughs> essentially what they people say is, the bullet performs so bad that you're going to have to really learn how to, you know, read when a long range shoot, if you want to shoot effectively. So then you're going to be a better long range shooter. That's essentially, essentially what they say. Oh, also the barrel, the barrel life's way long and you can get cheap surplus ammo, but you're not gonna be shooting cheap surplus ammo through a precision rifle. I mean, it, you, well, some of you might, you shouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> you know, typically, I mean, it's just like data shit in shit out. Yeah. Well, I mean, regardless of what gun or caliber it is generally you're gonna you're gonna find if you're shooting just factory you're gonna get a you're gonna get a gun you're gonna find what the gun likes yeah and it's not gonna be m80 ball sorry (laughs) so anyway you posted a reel and it was like well you know what's your thoughts on it and so kind of you know a lot of the things that people say about the 308 rifle it, it it seems to be the case that a 223 trainer rifle does everything it does and better because the ammo is even cheaper. It's less recoil. So you can really work on your fundamentals. Um, the barrel life's really good. And, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a nice little rifle to have. So, I mean, people also got to understand in a real format, we only have a minute more or less. And it's not always the most perfect platform, but it also kind of let, you know, yes, it's, it's a little bit entertainment, but there's also some factual things being said. We're a bit and, cheeky. Yeah. <laughs> but 
my my point was all that being said the 308 it's not worth it to me uh it's it's a very big compromise in every direction exactly. especially now because you know if you're if you're really shooting long range you're probably not going to be running a 308 if you already have one we get it like oh if you want to just go out and shoot and train that's fine but uh the ammo uh, anymore it's like within a couple bucks like for this okay, people will compare like wildly different ammos if you're buying the ammo from the manufacturer the same ammo for each type it's like within a couple bucks of six five creed more honestly i can find six five creed more way easier than i can find 308 mic match ammo personally. i'm still even if okay so i'm very much a part of that thought process of use what you have first but there is an exception as it pertains to learning now the video was learning to shoot long range now, we didn't say learning to shoot long range prs or anything like that it was simply put learning to shoot long range i'm still not going to recommend you to start with a 308 the amount of recoil is not it's not worth it here's the deal you probably wouldn't even want to you know starting from scratch you wouldn't want to start somebody out on even on even on a 6.5 creed i would i don't recommend that because I mean, long range like you have to get the fundamental marksmanship down before you even attempt to go long range. Yeah. That's why I always recommend a 22 long rifle first. Most everybody has one that you can begin marksman, uh, basic marksmanship fundamentals on. And then, okay, I always recommend a 223. Now, I would also recommend a Valkyrie, but the 223 ammo is way easier, way cheaper to find. Yeah. If you just want something to, to get reps in on, yes. Obviously. At the end of the day, that's what it boils down to is reps. Now, here's here's the here's what a lot of people do nowadays. And whether it's 308 or 65, a lot of people do a 308 too because it's just kind of like the old mindset. Is you go out and you get a, oh, I want a long-range gun, so you go out and get your 24-inch barrel, heavy Contour M24, 308 yeah. rifle, and you're like, oh, I'm going to start shooting long-range. But you kind of skip the fundamental parts because, you know, you're not a beginner. You don't need to do all that stuff. Right. And so, you of know, course not. you're going out, you're taking the 308, <laughs> which objectively has much shittier wind performance. You're, you're shooting long range with it. And what, what happens is for the, for 99% of people, a lot of your misses are going to be due to wind, but you, with the 308, you have such a, a bigger range of like improper wind calls because it is, you know, getting carried around a lot more by the wind. You're going to misattribute some of your shitty fundamentals so, oh, that was just my bad. It was a bad wind call. Well, I mean, also, it could when it, when it could be, oh, you were pulling the trigger incorrectly, right? Or inconsistently. Also, so if you're so if you're you're learning these, you're running through these uh, basic fundamentals on a higher. Now, okay, I'm not saying that 308 <laughs> is just god off recoil, but at the end of the day, we have to understand that it's more recoil than a 6.5. It's more recoil than a six creed. It's more recoil than anything else. All the way down to 22. Th- 223 it's more recoil and the minute you start introducing higher recoiling calibers into that very first very pivotal moment in your training it's going to make things a lot harder you're going to well, flinch for, yeah first of all you're yeah you're going to you're going to flinch you're going to develop that but it's not about being able to handle the recoil exactly I mean, you know you and i are both uh men so we can shoot big calories <laughs> uh, but still like and it's funny a lot of the prs guys are the ones that arguing this point but it's like why is it that that PRS has gone from chasing velocity to running these really light, like just just good enough to get it done six cal uh, projectiles on these twenty eight pound guns? It's and crazy it's, lack of recoil. Well, mostly like being able to stay in the scope, watch the trace from all positions, being able to spot your own impacts. That that's more advantageous than a lot of the other things. Well, it's because you know, John. Let's be here lost here. PRS is boring as shit. Yeah. They can they can they can only do so many things the same way so many times before they start uh, putting in these these weird acrobatic situations. But that's that's all that, you see that in all competition shooting, right? Because it's like we have to we have to keep the sport advancing so it becomes like self referential, and then uh, you go from being a long range shooting to like long range yoga. I mean, basically, yes. So it is more advantageous to run these basically zero recoil platforms now a lot of guys i'm surprised this didn't come up the other night in that in real the reason why they run the three away is because when they miss the target 
they, they could can see, see the bullet big, impact. Big splash, yeah. Big splash because a big, heavy, dirty bullet flying down range very slow. Again, back to my comment. The, uh, it's not worth it. The, the ad- higher recoil impulse do, uh, compared to the very low, uh, BC velocity, everything else. Now, okay. I get it. Everybody can load hot rod round rounds and everything else. We typically try to speak within Sammy specifications. I can load any round hot as hell and get it perform way better than what I pretty much gotten to the point anytime anybody talks about their load or their velocities on the it's, internet it's i just i don't even read it because i'm just it's irrelevant okay because you need to we're speaking to the masses we're speaking to the general public i mean although reloading has gotten popular even though it's almost hard to obtain stuff it's still the vast majority of your shooters are well, shooting some sort of factory ammo well even worse than that is we're talking a lot of our audience is obviously hunters where you don't want a 29 inch barrel. Exactly. So you're like, when you're shooting these older outdated cartridges, you're, uh, they're not like they need longer barrels to, to run efficiently to at semi spec, uh, pressures and velocities to get all that cartridge has to offer. They need longer barrels. It's just that simple. Whereas any, the newer stuff performs actually most time better in shorter barrels. Like it's, it's, uh, you know, this ain't that podcast. I'm not going to get into that too. Yeah. It's just not 308 is not what I would recommend learning long range in the, their argument about it'll make you better. Well, okay. F the 308, let's go with the 22 long rifle. That sucker gets thrown around. with a lot. Okay. Let's I, learn the, that. the one thing that I could see that makes sense is shooting a heavier recoiling gun is almost like a confirmation that you're doing the fundamentals, right? Right. Cause you're like, you'll know more like to check yourself on that. Right. Cause if you're shooting, if you're shooting those like no recoil guns, you're probably going to get sloppy. A lot um, of them. I mean, if you watch a lot of them closely because they're, they're gamed out rifles, they're like super heavy, super light triggers. If you watch them closely, that allows them to shoot a lot sloppier. Yeah. Now there's not the, the follow through aspect. I don't know. Falls apart. I mean, I'm still not recommending three Yeah, it's, it's just <laughs> it's preference, but uh, your preferences are wrong. That's, that's all there is to it. No, I'm, I'm sorry. The end. You're wrong. <laughs> but there's there's something else I want to address that was in those comments, uh, which Alley Munitions Instagram. You can go dig for the. It was the three away to the trainer rifle. There was right. Uh, there was a bit of back and learning forth. Learning long range shooting all three away yeah. rifle. I think it's what it's something it's like literally, that. you know, called that, and then they're like. But you didn't. But yeah, you're not. You're not talking about PR, like, I'm PRS shooter, and it's like, dude, like it's. Of course, when you start adding rules to things, it's going to change your approach on how you practice. I'm for still it. not going to use a three. Right, right, like legitimately. <laughs> right, well, yeah, no, you're not going to use a three oh eight. But it's like, why aren't you taking into consideration this style of shooting? And it's like we're just general long range. Like if you intro into long range type stuff. Like it's if not, you were ideal world, and it, we get cost as a factor. So if you start talking multiple rifles, that's a whole thing. But then these guys are like. You're going to have to get a 223, you know, you can go get a 223 train. It doesn't have to be a, you know, custom doubt 223. No. You can just get a bolt gun and 223. Bergara. Guess what? You can use a freaking Ruger American to learn the, uh, the bare essentials. Yeah. It, it doesn't, you don't have to get a, a gamer gun 223. I'm, I'm typically not even going to speak to PRS people. I don't, it's, it pertains to like, well, PRS people should go to PRS people. I mean, to exactly. Learn. They, they also already think they know it all. So anyways, yeah. we'll just leave that there. But so, but anyways, what would, would essentially happen is a bit of an argument. Like everybody's like, who's this guy? Who's this? like, <laughs> don't get me wrong. Wade gives off massive boomer FUD energy, but it's kind of funny. Cause he's like, not at all. But like you see him start to talk and you're like, Oh, this fucking guy, <laughs> especially if you're like a PRS shooter and you're like, you know, you think you know everything. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I'm just going to say this and I don't care who it upsets. PRS isn't hard. It's that simple. You're shooting these uh, larger targets, uh, typically gamed guns and gamed calibers. It's not that hard. You ask some of the positions and stupid shit they make you do to try and make the sport a little bit harder, maybe a little bit difficult, but it's not that hard. Get over yourself. It's like, it's choreography. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, guess what? If you would just practice, 
with non stupid calibers. <laughs> well, and you you kind of see this with uh, you know, you have like the NRO Hunter pop up, and that's getting a lot more popular. That has my interest because I mean, not, not so much from a competitive aspect, but uh, it's training. It's great training. I think I think more people should attend those kind of events. Yeah, uh, pre pre hunting season especially. But there was a very interesting subject that came up as part of this consequence of this argument. And it was uh, recoil or suppressors adding recoil. <laughs> um, I just, to address that here, uh, no, they don't. <laughs> that, um, but I mean, if on a bolt gun, no. Yeah, I could see on a semi-automatic, if you're, you know, you have a high back pressure can, it's obviously going to add a, the bolt is going to get an increased velocity, right? Because that, that gas pressure. So the the bolt coming back is introducing recoil into the system, especially if it's smacking the back, like if you don't have it properly tuned. So that could increase the recoil impulse. But I mean, this guy, this one, this one guy was convinced that, you know, suppressors are just, they're always, all suppressors are always going to add recoil over, over anything else. When in reality, it's probably, they're probably not as effective. Most of them is like a three chamber break. Uh, but a three chamber bake's also fucking loud. Fuck that. Yeah, no. Yeah, that's no. But anyway, I don't want to. I don't want to dwell too much on that. <laughs> but the good news is, uh, Wade. Wade has decided uh, to become my coach. I expect nothing but uphill battles. <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna. He's gonna turn me into a PRS shooter. We'll see. If you'll commit, I'll commit. How about that? Am I allowed to treat you as a small child? I wouldn't expect anything okay. less or more. I don't know which one to say on that. <laughs> if you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a <laughs> Yeah, I, I want you to Mr. Miyagi me on long range shooting. We'll be like fixing a fixing a tractor and like, you know, it's like doing the working the positions. First of all, no, it's gonna be a lot of painting off of ladders. I was gonna say good yeah. on ladders. What what <laughs> what brand of ladder is preferred by the top level PRI shooters? I have no idea. We need to find this out. Yeah, what's a what's a tier one ladder? <laughs> uh, I'll get on Amazon right now. Uh, am I gonna have to drag out the boat? The boat? Yeah. Oh, the boat, yeah. I was thinking of like an actual boat. No. Like, what does that have to do with anything? I don't I think there was a couple that built a boat out of an actual boat, which is kinda cool. That is pretty cool. So I'm going to need to get a bunch of, I need a bunch of nylon and like the bean bag material. You need all the bags. Yeah. All the way up to, a, okay. The only PRS type of event I went to, there was a guy there who literally had a bag, the size of a bean bag. Literally the guy had an effing bean bag. A bean bag chair. Yes. Hell yeah. Was it tie dye? And they let him use it. It's At a certain st- point, let's just calm down here. That's the problem. That's where it becomes that self-referential, like literally filled all the void. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I can, I can fill the void in my shooting position, but I can't fill the void in my heart. Um, anyway, I think we've, we've distracted enough away from the yes. main topic. Uh, we, we've totally went down a total different rabbit hole. This, this is a, uh, if you guys don't want to know how it goes off camera, it's a, <laughs> about like that with a little bit more cussing yeah and, a lot uh, more cussing and a lot more side dragging yes okay oh show your book you got a book i got a book you didn't get to meet him unfortunately unfortunately but uh old, old wyman Winzer was in town last week got you a little autograph book there. it's a big 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 old book you're welcome it's pretty sweet i can't wait wait to read it <laughs> you, you can't read we knew it we knew it all along <laughs> folks as long as there's lots of pictures. Oh, I, I still need to thumb through mine, but uh, yeah, a lot of really good pictures. Oh, I'm sure there is. Um, but predator hunting ARs. So let's... The AR market, obviously... Oh, well, hang on. Oh, okay. Before we even get started, we're going to be coming at this completely and 100% from a suppressed standpoint. Like yeah. Anything we talk about... Is suppressed. <laughs> and that's that's. I mean, that's not even just with this conversation. That's across. That's the board. literally everything. Always, we, ever. We we are practical people. Major proponents of the suppressed, and we shoot exclusively suppressed. Like very rarely do we shoot unsuppressed. Uh, nowadays, I just won't do it if it's not suppressed. Yeah, I mean that. That's just. It's that simple. But that's okay. So anything we talk about is going to be talking about suppressed. Uh, where should we begin? Is the caliber so selection? I guess what I was gonna say is is the uh, 
is the goal here to educate people on what they should be looking for for a predator hunting AR? Or what's the what's your end goal? End goal is basically basically due to the six arc, yeah. the uh, AR fifteen has gotten more. Okay, let's okay. Then we'll rewind a little bit. Uh, a little bit of touching on Wade's history with ARs. He hated them five years ago, but he's finally came over to the. To the That's uh, not true. Dark side. I liked them before going suppressed. And then as soon as I went suppressed, I hated them because I, you know, all the gas in your face and all that stuff. And then I started playing with the tuning and all that stuff. And we also had like those early generation suppressors that really meant for a bolt gun. I didn't have none of the smaller like AR yeah. specifically. Ones. So it was like, it just made things complicated. Yeah. So as new suppressors come out that handle the AR platform better. And then like, I would have to say what really brought me back around was that, uh, tunable boat, uh, bootleg boat. Yeah, bootleg, yeah. That's what I was like, Oh, this is pretty awesome. And then what really, uh, got me going was I started rethinking like our ammo situation, you know, as far as specifically two twenty three is, you know, we got all that two twenty three was never going to be a big seller for us. Cause you can get it so cheap. Yeah. You know, there's a million different, lo- like every, yeah, it, load. It, especially then, uh, there's already a lot of great options and it, it just, you know, we'd offer one or two and that's about it. You know, until I started messing with that, you know, I thought it's pressure getting super highly popular and shorter barrel platforms are getting really highly popular. There has to be a way I could really tune these loads to that specific setup. So that kind of revamped the whole situation. Then I started seeing like, oh, there's a lot to this. Like this is, this is way better when you have a load that's optimized for a certain length barrel running suppressed. Like you don't have to have so much gas to face. Cause okay, let's talk about five, five, six or two, two, three MO for AR 15 platforms. Typically when you buy a lower cost factory rifle and lower cost factory MO, they make that shit just run. It's going to be over overly gas, but the the platform is going to run. Yeah, that's that's on the rifle and on the ammunition side. So the yeah, 100%. ammo is super gassy. The the rifles, because you know if if I'm an AR manufacturer, right, I'm doing it scale. You're obviously going to have tolerance ranges, and the last thing you want is guns coming back because it's like oh that won't cycle. So a lot of these companies, they their gas ports are oversized, and it's just like because there's so much different garbage quality ammo too yeah. and there's this perception that everybody's like it should even like on the high dollar rifles my high dollar rifle should run the cheapest shittiest ammo and that's indicative of quality when that's not people are people are coming around to the idea that that's not the case anymore yeah um but before we before we deep dive that let's gloss over to the to the people who are not like they see an ar for hunting and they're just like no yeah that's another reason why i want to do this so like what are you know, obviously, you know, you have a lightweight system that's pretty versatile. Um, I mean, semi-automatic is nice. There's kind of a back and forth with that on hunting. Uh, but what are your, what are your big reasons? Why do you like? For what, again, you know, going back to the ammo and everything else and the whole replacing the shotgun with a semi-auto platform, that really, really sparked my interest even more. And then the Valkyrie start kicking the interest up some more. And then the six arc really solidified that situation. But I mean, I still run a lot of two, three threes, but it's the fact that you could take this super lightweight platform. I can have one magazine that has enough ammo to last me for a while, as opposed to like my, even your detachable magazine bolt guns, you're going to be pretty limited to 10 rounds. And then a lot of times, like when you're out with a AR type platform, you're going to be somewhere where there's probably going to be pigs and cows. So having the ability to have 30 rounds of that magazine is super handy. And again, with the, everything just kind of steamrolled, like with the popularity of pistol brace ARs and like the, the pin welded barrels and all that stuff, you can get a shorter package. And then we started developing this ammo that was highly optimized for the shorter barrels. I started looking at it like, gosh, dang, these are perfect truck guns. And that's what just kind of led me down that path. And then again, with the new cartridges coming out and so on and so forth, it's just mag capacity. Typically, you can build them super lightweight. LPVO is getting better. Uh, that just kind of added to the fire. And again, suppressor is getting better. Uh, just everything started to kind of fall in line to where I just I found myself 
especially with the advent of these new better cartridges for the AR-15 platform, I found myself reaching for AR-15 more often. So it's kind of like just what quick synopsis, I guess, is what really started changing my mind, essentially. Now, there's there's still cons. You know, yeah. I'm not going to. I'm not going to try and sell you like this is the way, but they're, it's a tool on the toolbox. That's yes. hundred percent. They're just handy. I mean, well, the, the other side of that is you can also have a gun set up for hunting that is more than adequate for like home defense. That's what or, I was about to get to is especially with all the modern advancements and everything is literally, you could take your, most everybody has an AR 15, whether or not they hunt with it's told a different story, but most everybody has one for home defense. You could totally use this platform for both. And what that actually allows you to do is more time on the trigger training with that platform. So in, in case of emergency at your house, you actually have some time behind it. Cause for a long time, uh, I had an AR for a long time that just literally sit by the bed. I'd take it out every once in a while and shoot it. And that was about it. Well, the more I started pra- practicing for hunt, cause I'll put way more, <laughs> way more importance like, on practice. You're like my, my life Ugh, <laughs> hunting. Yeah. <laughs> So what that did was it changed a few things for me, like uh, platforms as far as length and like certain stocks, certain optics. And, you know, I don't get too crazy in the lights, which I know you know all the good lights and all that stuff. And I probably should care more about the lights. But most of the time, like, I don't want a light on my daytime rig for predator hunting. But if I had one rig for everything, I'd 100% have a good light on it. Yeah. And again, when you start looking at that AR side of the world, like there are some really good lights that you can totally take out and do some nighttime hunting with. Yep. Yeah. Uh, the, no problem. You know, obviously Surefire now has the, their turbo series, but, but prior to that, it was the, the mod lights, which use the big thing is you step up to a, like an 18650 or an 18350. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of like long range, like they're super high candela. So it really throws that beam long range. Yeah. Even, I mean, even if you're running one of our chairs, uh, and you, you're, you're running the uh, economy class, which doesn't come stock with any sort of light stems. A lot of guys are still running the light shiner with, that use them chairs or whatever, like a dedicated guy that shines the light, which I have no idea why you want to still do that. But anyways, when it comes time to shoot, you can usually use it. Generally, you can use just use your weapon line, especially as good as they're getting nowadays. Now, they're not as good as bright as the big high-powered Predator hunting lights, but as far as dispatching a coyote a couple hundred yards, totally doable. And I think you've you've also seen a you've seen a large large convergence because a lot of the AR guys have gotten into hunting largely because you know they're getting night vision, they're getting thermal, and they're like, oh, I guess I go shoot hogs, and then yeah, you know, some of them get some coyotes while they're out hog hunting, and they think they're yeah. predator hunters, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's you you kind of seen that convergence of the two, whereas. They were pretty separate, you know, maybe 10 years ago. Um, yeah, you know, especially since thermal's been getting way cheaper and better, a lot of guys who would typically just run a bolt gun predator hunting, they have started swapping over to the AR-15s on a similar well, to the fact of eye relief most of the time. Well, especially with hog hunting. Like yeah, that's, and hog hunting, that's a total different. I mean, there's nothing like running a bolt gun. I'll tell you right now, like bolt guns, better than anything. Yeah. But... If it's about rounds down range, rounds on target, obviously, if you got a semi auto platform with a good thermal, that's pretty optimal for hog hunting. Now, I tend to like the clip on night vision, but I still scan with the thermal. But majority of your people are buying these lower cost thermals. Well, the, the other side, they that, put them on AR. You're pretty experienced versus if I don't have any experience calling or scanning for animals at night and I just throw a thermal on, it's yeah. like. The, the amount of the amount you gain there is so much more. Yeah, um, it, it, also, it's going to depend on your your local environment, right? Like where yeah. where are you hunting? Because sometimes there are situations thermal doesn't work too good. Same thing yeah. with night vision. Yeah, so, I mean <clears throat> the the worst part about it, and we're not going to make this about thermal night vision, but I'm going to touch on a few things because it kind of. So the worst the the worst part about hunting in this thicker country, like say Northeast and East Texas, where there's also lots of pigs most time is you can get by with a cheaper thermal. But at the end of the day, that cheaper thermal isn't going to 
work as well in those types of environments, like the higher humidity, the thicker brush and everything else. And it doesn't matter what thermal you have. If the brush is too thick or if the trees are throwing off so much heat from the daytime, no thermal is going to be able to see through that. So, I mean, the thermal isn't the end all be all, Yeah, but it is a great solution for pig hunting. And again, we'll, we'll wait to really dive down that road on a different podcast. Yeah. So anyway, that, I mean, that kind of covers the why I think behind ARs. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 again, the primary reason I see for more and more people reaching out to me, asking about AR platforms, number one, six arcs really sparked a lot of interest. Number two, more and more people are going out and buying a thermal for pigs and they, they start to, some of them start starting to utilize them for varmint hunting. So the AR 15 platform is just a great platform for that type of, you know, situation. So you want to go through calibers first, like just a quick glance on calibers and AR 15 for, you know, some people may not even know. I mean, I had a guy, an older gentleman reach out the other day wondering about calibers for AR 15. Let's, let's, we'll do calibers last. Cause that's going to lead into the next podcast. That's true. Let's talk about, you know, there's obviously one of the most, one of the biggest things that's become is building your own. Yeah. Um, before we get to that, let's talk about, cause I don't know. I'm, I, I don't mind. I'll build my own. It's like, I can't find what I want. Um, but it, it is, there's something nice buying a factory rifle. Yeah, there's a lot nowadays, of I don't know if you're not a tinker or any kind of mechanically inclined or anything like that. Don't, don't even mess with building your own. Cause I, I get these, I feel these questions too. I built this, 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 and it's not cycling, you know, and it's like, I don't know over. The well, and, and that, that's more so when you, especially when you get into like some oddball calibers, yeah. because you, you, going into it, you're going to have to get tools. If you like doing it, I mean, it's nice. It's a good way to learn the, learn how an AR-15 yes, works. Absolutely. But after you build enough of them, you're just kind of like, can I just get one off the rack? Like, I don't know. I still like building them. I We've did, we did this last year with a lot of the, the six arcs. Is I liked buying buying a complete gun and then just changing the barrel out. That was really I mean, nice. that's nice too. And it, you know, there are certain we'll get to that. There are certain circumstances where I would recommend that, especially if you are looking for a better quality firearm. Yeah, you know, and there's like sometimes I just don't want to track down all the parts, or yeah. it's one yeah. of those things where it's like too many options, and I'm just going to get in the weeds. Yeah. Um. I'm actually dealing with that right now. I literally just got a, I got a low receiver in us, the, that 12, five, six arc barrel from the in. And I'm just like, Oh, but I have to like track down parts. And I'm just, <laughs> that's overwhelming. But uh, I mean, but there are just grillions of websites and parts and yeah, all kinds of stuff. So, I mean, it probably comes down like you need to know who you are. If you're that guy, build one. If you're not that guy, buy one or, buy one do a barrel swap if you're wanting to swap to a different caliber but i mean i think where we should start first is factory rifles because I, I see this a lot too yeah and i would say my personal opinion <laughs> is uh spend the most amount of money you can and do your research yeah there's here's the deal you can always go buy if you're just like you know, maybe you're on a tight budget. You know, we don't know who you are and you can't spend the money. You can always go get a Palmetto state armory and like, they're going to function. They're going to be great. Accuracy might, you're, you're generally going to get decent act. Most out almost any of the guns these days. Um, but if you wanted to go cheap, just go to PSA. They're, they're the, the biggest for a reason, but if you know, I kind of like, I like nicer things, you yeah. know, and there's certain things you step up to and, um, maybe certain features you want, maybe a certain color you want, right? Like, yeah, yeah. Because nowadays it's gotten popular to have all these different colors. I, uh, you know, I made a joke at the beginning, but I, I'm a big Noveski guy. Mostly the barrels are amazing. I just like the company personally. Um, but their fit and finish is like top of the line. They have a bunch of different Sweet. options. Yeah. Um, you really like the Type A's? You've been I really like the. Uh, I really like the Type A's. Uh, they're going to be up, you know, up there in costs, like around a guy's lead type cost. And it, it also depends, like they have some lower cost ones. Like if you just want to buy black AR, their standard platforms are still great. Uh, but if you can go all the way up to like a clone from them, like they do all kinds yeah. of crazy stuff. It's really cool. Uh, they're not actually clone correct though, uh, as a certain <laughs> friend of ours would tell you. Sean Borg. But, uh, you Geisley, know. Yeah. Guys, they make some fantastic rifles. They're, they're, 
Bill Geisley's super on the accuracy train, especially right now. His there's new six arcs coming out good, and they've gotten some crazy field reports. That's actually being used by certain uh, agencies in the Department of Defense. Um, yeah, I really the Geisleys I think are a really good deal for what you get. Yeah, and you can get them in tan, which is great. Tan anodized, which is great. Yeah. Um, Sons of Liberty Gunworks, they're uh, yeah. huge fans of them. The, you can get pretty affordable rifles from them, made in made out of San Antonio, Texas, using pretty. For me, that's kind of like the baseline. Like if I want a quality AR, my like very base is Sons of Liberty, and then I go up from there. Um, so yeah, definitely check them out. Uh, who else? I like so we're kind of going all over the place with price point. Yeah, it's, I like, like I said, if, you, if you're wanting to cheap out PSA, if you're wanting to spend more money, take a look at some of these other companies. Sons of Liberty, Geisley, uh, Type A, Noveski. Um, who else? There's there's another brand that I'm, I'm thinking of. Triarch? Tri- I don't know what their current status is. I don't, I don't either. I haven't seen. Yeah. But they've, they've had some company issues. Obviously, Q on the upper end, if you can ever find one in stock. Well, that's a honey bat. Yeah, yeah. I still I want one of the 223s, but. Yeah. There's, uh, there's a lot of really good options out there for factory. And again, factory is you want to get a gun. You don't want to have to think about it. And it's just get ready to go. Yeah. Top end stuff. So, I mean, I tend to look at it from uh, this standpoint, like on the, the low side, I just, I start looking at, I, I know me, I know I'm going to want to do something to the trigger. That's what you're going to get on these lower cost budget builds. Typically is kind of a sh- crappy trigger. And if you're coming straight from a bolt gun, you're going to hate the triggers, like the the standard mil spec triggers. They're going to be garbage, hot garbage. Uh, there's nowadays there's grillions of different options on replacement triggers. Geisley, obviously one of the better ones. I really like the trigger tech ones. I have used uh, some of the Timney ones. Had a few problems with them here and there, but I've never had any issues out of trigger techs, and I've never had any issues out of Geisley. Yeah. Uh, and I, there's, I've got some lower cost ones. I can't remember the names of them. They've worked fine, but they're also not on high use platforms. So I can't give you like a super long term in depth. But I can tell you some of my most used platforms. They either have Geisleys or they have trigger tags. Yeah, and so one of the one of the hardest things to navigate. There's there's really two mindsets when it comes to AR-15s. You have like the this is my end of the world rifle, right? Everything yeah. has to be overbuilt. And then you have a lot of the hunting stuff, which typically is going to focus more on, you know, accuracy and lightweight. Yeah. So there's certain qualities, like when you get into barrels, you know, like chrome lined barrels, that's what's considered mil spec. It's, it's good for the longevity of the barrel, but actually not necessarily good for accuracy. So what you'll see sometimes is a lot of the cheaper guns actually have more accurate barrels. Yeah. That's what I was about to say. Uh, I remember way back there was a, it's called core 15. They make anything from like dirt cheap. Well, they used to, I don't even know if they're still a thing, but they used to make anything from the dirt rifle. Cheap you rifles. had was like an $800 rifle. They used to make dirt cheap rifles all the way up to like $2,500 rifles. I'd never seen of their expensive stuff. Just the cheap stuff. But the back then it started out as like a $400 rifle and I shot it and it shot amazing. I'm like, what? Because I, I didn't expect nothing. Like I was expecting four inch grips, a hundred yards, you know, and it like, it was stacking one whole group. So I'm like, Oh, this thing needs some more money put into it. So what I end up with is I bought a $400 rifle, which you used to be able to do that then, but what it ended up being was like probably a $1,500 rifle. Yeah. But the main premise being literally, I just kept the upper and lower in the barrel, <laughs> literally changed everything <laughs> else out. And I would end up with, it was a very nice, great shooting rifle. And this kind of uh, goes into the, you know, one of the biggest things is you have this happen a lot. Guys will get cheaper rifles and upgrade. And this is almost why I kind of, you know, if you're, if you're getting into your first rifle, I would wreck, I would steer you towards getting a complete rifle. Yeah. Cause then what's invariably going to happen is you're either going to want to change things out on it, or you're going to like want to build another rifle, but then you'll have the context. Like if you're, if you're just getting into it, you're not going to know what you want. You're not going to know no, what you like. No. Uh, so, but if you have a rifle, you can kind of play around with that. And then when you go to build like another rifle, you know, cause you're going to want, you know, if you have a long guy, maybe you want a short 300 blackout or something else, yeah. you'll kind of n- learn what your preferences are and then save a bunch of money because I mean, yeah, I, I literally start- <laughs> just like I said, started out super cheap, spent all money. Now, back when I first got into ARs, I did the same thing. Uh, I ended up going 
at the end of the day, it was probably just a thousand dollar rifle by the time I was done. But what I did was I went through so many different parts, yeah, picking and choosing what I like. Where if you looked at the total cost, and then I just had a junk drawer of used parts, I'm probably in this rifle five grand. <laughs> I I did the same thing. So I uh, I first started building AR-15s when I was 14 years old, um, and I you know. I was work. I had a job, so like every end of every week, I had like two hundred bucks, maybe three hundred bucks. I could I could throw out parts, so I'd like order a couple parts online. And like every week, I was getting parts and switching everything out. And like the original rifle I built, like kind of like you said, it's like it was a two thousand dollar rifle that wound up being a six thousand dollar rifle just because <laughs> so much crap. Yeah, so much crap that I, oh, oh, let me change this out, or maybe you know I spent a hundred dollars on a flash hider, and now I want that two hundred dollar flash hider. <laughs> so I'm going to change that out. And uh, yeah, you go down that rabbit hole. Um, that's what, you know, I'd probably, it probably just depends. Like most people just getting into AR platforms. I'd be like, what's your budget for just the rifle Buy the best thing you can get within that budget, not start with the core 15 situation and like start building it up. Cause what, I mean, what could happen is, okay, let's just say I like to tinker. So I'm going to buy this low cost rifle. And then do what you did, build it up and check out parts. Cause I don't mind. Yeah. Well, what could happen is it's so low cost crappy. You could just, it'd be a bad experience and you just could get completely out of it. So probably, you know, a little bit more money towards that budget. Get a, get a decent rifle to begin with. It's what I typically try to recommend. Cause I, there's going to be people that say, this is just as good. <laughs> just as good. Now, well, yeah, if you, if you buy quality from the outset, you'll have a, a, ben, a benchmark for what it yeah. even look like in the yeah. first place. And then, and then, I mean, even, and then I'm not saying even if you buy a quality AR platform, you're not going to change it because I do the same crap all the time. Like, I'll make slight changes. Like, typically, I'll, I like a very particular set of furniture. Yeah. That's, so That's it, the word. Like, nobody ever, like, puts what I like from the fact I know, that. I don't get that. Uh, I have so many like two hundred dollars stocks that are just sitting in a yeah in a in a bin. I usually and I'm getting close to to it right now. Like I'll save up furniture that I don't even like, and then every once in a while I just give it all away because I'm never going to use this stuff. Yeah, because I have a very particular huge Magpul fan. Uh, yep, there S is the SLK the yeah the, the SLK one? is one of my favorites. One of my favorites yeah. for a general purpose anything from the bedside all the way to hunting, and then the PRS three light or whatever it's called gen three light for a uh dmr if i can call it that oh, gosh. type situation and those are really the, the only two butt stocks i like like it, literally everything else i don't care much for anymore yeah uh, it's it's that simple so like i said i mean if you can buy higher quality platform off the get-go it's probably going to give you a better user experience yeah probably and not like if you buy say like the smith and wesson sport now i'm sure they're fine. No, oh, Sport 2 is great. Great rifle. Uh, lower cost, but you're, after you hunt for a while, you're probably going to swap some things out, you know, and it, and it may, it may be a bad user experience and turn you away from it. So just, yeah, it's one of those things when the, you know, generally what people are going to want to switch out is hand guards. That's kind of like the biggest pain in the ass is switching out on anything. So it's like at that point, just, it's almost, you're almost easier off just to build it from the outset. Yeah. Do, I mean, again, do a lot of research because there's a lot of, a lot of great manufacturers we ain't mentioning. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of lower end cost manufacturers. Uh, there's, I mean, again, there's just unlimited possibilities, especially once you start uh, shopping online. Yeah. Uh, again, come up with a budget just for the rifle. Don't, you know, don't worry about your optics. That just, What am I going to spend on this platform and go from there? Or if you're going to build one, like if, if you've been around enough, you want to build one buy quality parts. I mean, if you're going to, you're searching the internet, there's not a platform out there that has everything just like you want. And you have the ability and kind of know how to build, put one together. And that's something you think you're going to enjoy. There's nothing wrong. I like, I enjoy putting them together. Yeah. Cause I have like very specific parts for specific stuff. Now, the exception of this is companies like type a, where you can order your platform exactly how you want it. Yeah. The uh the two type A rifles I just got, the twins as I'm dubbing them, is a sixteen inch six arc and a sixteen inch two two four Valkyrie. And I was able to order them exactly how I wanted them, except 
I still swapped out the furniture. <laughs> the the uh, buttstock pistol grip. I still swapped him out. Or no, just the buttstocks. That's right. But any other time, like I'm usually like I want specific things, like specific bolt carriers, and their their platform came with a great trigger. Everything like that's my one of my biggest pet peeves on ARs is having a good trigger. Uh, because I could really, you can have a otherwise a great shooting platform. Like everything's there to shoot fantastic, and the trigger can just ruin uh your ability to shoot good groups. What's your, what's your favorite Geisley model trigger? I don't know all the models. Do you like the flat shoe? Yes. Uh. Probably the the. I don't know what it's called, but I just know it's flat shoe. Yeah, well, super dynamic. It would be. I don't know all the yeah. models. I know. I know. My two current favorites is that Geisley flat shoe, and then the most I common really, is the the SSAE, which is like their. It's like a lighter weight, but like still like their quote unquote combat trigger. I and then really, there would be like the SDE would be the model probably that you're talking about. So it's two stage trigger flat. I'm like, huge, especially on ARs. Uh, well, same thing for bow guns. Huge fan of flat shoe and huge fan of two stage. Yeah, I like a two stage. And I really like that trigger tech. It's, I need it's to shoot it. Wonderful, trigger. absolutely wonderful. Let's say no budget. I'm going to spend whatever I need to to get this a good AR platform in 223. Who are you buying? You can pick one. Oh me? Yep. Uh, wait. This is for hunting. Yeah. Oh, Noveski or Geisley or a Knight's Armor. I said one. <laughs> well, I'm going to go Noveski just because it's me. But I'm probably going to go Geisley. Yeah. I mean, I, I love my Noveski, but I also like the Geisley. You're going to make me have one. Rifle? I don't know. Screw you. I'm, and you know what? I'm I'm going back on what I just said. I'm I'm going Type A. Yeah. Just because I can I can for about the same price. Well, if I don't get carried away. <laughs> yeah. I can get exactly what I want as, as it pertains to certain things. Whereas, like, again, with the Geisley, you're you're only going to have so many options. Uh, Noveski. I don't know. I'd be curious to see once that six arc Geisley gets announced next month. I'll, I'm ready to get that one, even though I was, I'm pretty I'm pretty heavy on six arcs right now. <laughs> yeah, but they're doing they're doing some interesting stuff yeah, with like no, reinforcing the receivers, and uh, I'm ready. I'm ready to see it. It's very it's. The stuff, the reinforcing stuff they did, it's very reminiscent of that. Not the newest Type A cup. I mean, uh, Cobalt Kinetics company, the older Cobalt Kinet- Cobalt Kinetics. That res- all that stuff yeah. I have, it's kind of the same stuff. Yeah, but anyways, I digress. Okay, moving on to building your own. I, I don't, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to get too heavy on building your own, just because that again, that's right? No, a huge rabbit hole. There's, there's probably still videos available on YouTube, unless they've just completely scrubbed them all. Yeah, uh, you can learn a lot from YouTube. Obviously, don't trust nothing sketchy looking. The, the the few biggest things you need to know, you need to have good set of torque wrenches, which you should have anyway if you're an adult, um, if you're adult male especially. Uh, so good, you need a you make a three eighths or a half inch, uh, you know that that kind of torque wrench, and then probably some kind of either like Wheeler or similar like quarter bit driver torque wrench. Yeah. Um, and then you need, and don't skimp on this, you need a white lithium grease or similar for the barrel nut because it's aluminum to steel usually. You don't want that to go. And if you're doing your own buffer tubes and don't go for something like the PWS system, really look into staking your castle nut. That's that's something you need to do. Past that, everything you, else is... You left out, you want a quality, in my opinion, quality... Uh, Rail pin punch set. Oh yeah, yeah. You're, you're gonna need AR, AR, yeah. AR stuff because like, what's that and it's company? It's so easy to get that stuff now. It used to be a pain. Um, what's that company? I got the real price. avid. Real avid does a lot of specific stuff They're, now. The, the, the tools are a little cheap, but they work. Some of the tools. If you're used to stare it, like if you're a quality guy, you're you're gonna be like, oh, this shit. Sucks. Yeah. But Some of the stuff I, I wouldn't recommend. Particularly the the milled out. It's for the the bolt catch. Because that's kind of tricky to get in. So, you know, they'll actually have the roll pin punches where it holds the roll pin versus like you just like using a straight punch or even like the ball in punch. I would recommend their roll pin punch set. Yeah. I would. Rec- they have a armor's block. It's cheap. I highly recommend it though. No, no, I'm saying it's cheap. Like oh. you, you should definitely have one. It, well, it has stuff that you're not going to find on other armor's yeah. blocks that'll hold the. The lower in certain positions, making stuff like the bolt catch easy to put in, all that stuff. Like, yeah, I highly recommend their 
armor's block in the roll pin punch set. Past that, I'm just kind of like, meh. Uh, get, you know, if you're going to get in the habit of building ARs, uh, I love the company. When the, the first one I saw was it's called an Oops Kit. But they have the kits with extra You spring. better have that shit. You man. want extra spring detents. Because <laughs> you're going to lose them. You're probably going to, like, the first few times you do some stuff, you're going to lose some springs. When you put that front de- takedown <laughs> pin in and you launch, you launch the D10 across the room. Yes. Um, the uh, old-fashioned trick, you use a pillowcase. You do it in a pillowcase. Yeah. It's, a, it's old school. The oops kit, highly recommend it. Um, but in terms of other tools, like, other than basic mechanical knowledge, you don't really need it. It's super No, easy. you can get by with, really, you can get by with even more minimal shit than we just said. Yeah, I, <laughs> but I, I I highly recommend those. If you're gonna get things. into it, get into it because it's yeah. you know before you used to have to like track down to now it's again it's easy. The and this is gonna get into the next this is gonna segue into the next part, which is tuning the rifle. But the biggest problem you're generally gonna have, at least in my experience with ARs, is gas blocks when they're pinned. Is knocking them out kind of sucks. Yeah. Um. So that's a whole other thing. This is the problem. This is why I don't like building a lot of rifles personally. Now, for hunting, it may, maybe it makes more sense. But you know, you, you know, just to explain, you know, let me. I'll put a picture here. You have your you have your barrel and you have your gas block. Generally speaking, from a lot of the quality manufacturers, they're going to be like double pin and everything on there. Versus a lot of guys are when they build their ARs, they're literally just running set screws on the bottom. Way less secure. Yeah. Also, it doesn't necessarily guarantee good alignment of that gas block. And so the, what the gas block does is there's a little port, gas port on your barrel, and it bleeds the gas to the system, which is what cycles the bolt. Which is known as direct impingement. Well, te- if you want to get really oh, technical. God, hear, uh, actually. It's, there, there is an argument made that it could <laughs> that it actually isn't direct impingement. Um, well, that's what it's going to be commonly referred to. Yeah, yeah. When you're call it direct impingement. But, uh. You know, essentially the the inside of your bolt carrier is acting as the piston, so it's relocating that as opposed to having a piston on the end of the gun. It's in, internal to the system, um, and that's what that's where we get into the most complicated and tricky aspects of ARs. Well, I mean, it also doesn't help. There's so much shit on well, the market, yeah, that claims to to be for this and that and this and that, and like, and a lot of guys get caught up in the weeds and they start buying all this different shit. To add to their system before they even shot it once with just what they have. Yeah. And it becomes this nightmare of trying to tune this son of a bitch, especially when you run suppressed. Yeah. So what happens is when you throw a suppressor on the end of the gun, typically with most suppressor designs, I'm going to asterisk that statement, uh, you're going to increase overall back pressure in the system. And what that does, what that means is however that gun was designed with the gas port sizing and everything it has. And depending on the ammo used, there's a really big one that everybody fucks up. Yeah. Depending on the ammo you use, it's going to introduce more gas into that system, and that's where you're going to have gas spray in your face, and you're going to be like, man, I hate shooting AR-15 suppress. Yeah. It and can, it can be it can be very nerve-wracking. It like, it I kind of like the smell, tur- but I'm a weirdo. It completely turned me off to ARs for a while. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I'm just like, ugh. This is terrible. Yeah, and over the years, right? So I, I've you know, been doing suppressed ARs for a long time. Now, there's so many different things that people do because, you know, it'll actually come out on the, the, the top receiver of the air right where your nose is the charging handle. Yeah. Depending on how bad it is, it'll come out right there. So you have people, now you have like specific, before there was one, but now you have a bunch of different uh, charging handles that are like designed to help like seal it up better. But people would put silicone there. Yeah. Um, there's little gas events that you can replace your Ford assist with where it'll kind of vent the gas out to the side. Um, yeah, just in, in general, it's dirty. Shooting suppressed on a bolt gun, on, a, on an AR-15, like just when you shoot an AR-15 suppressed, just look at your magazine. Yeah. You'll, I mean, see, the, you, you'll see the bullets. You'll see it's it's dirty. You're Because it's the minute you put put a suppressor on the end of that sucker, it's like he said, it's more pressure, i.e. more gas coming back into the system. Yep. Now... You just might as well get used to the fact that you're going to have to clean that bastard more often than you would not suppress. Totally worth it, in my opinion. But, so I mean, regardless well, that's, of... That, that, that's, that's debatable, right? Because there's... No. Just, you can throw more lube at no, it. And the AR-15 it. is uh, notorious stop. for working well. You're you're making it okay not to clean your firearms. This yeah. is one of my pet peeves. Yes. A firearm is a tool. Yep. And you must maintenance tools. 
meh. <laughs> I know, no. I'm just as guilty. Like, I hate cleaning my arse. So I'm just like, I still don't love you quite like I do a bolt gun. Yeah. <laughs> but th- this is one one thing that people don't think about is, okay, so we're, we're run suppressed. Obviously, we're civilized. Uh, the more you, the longer you shoot it, the more you shoot it, more shit builds up right there. And the more shit comes out right there. Okay. So if you at least keep that portion of the, basically the upper and lower where the magazine feeds in and the boat goes and everything. If you keep that shit more clean, that's less shit getting thrown back in your face. Cause except at a certain point where it builds up enough, where it creates its own barrier, just takes it. And then your yeah. shit doesn't even work. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, just know that it's going to require uh, more cleaning than normal if you run a suppressor. I mean, at a certain point, you're going to have to clean it. I don't care how much lube you put in there. The only problem is, like he said, it's like this ticking time bomb. <laughs> because if you don't clean it, just keep lubing that bitch. It's eventually just going to come down to where it won't cycle anymore. And then you're just like, why did I let this happen? Oh, yeah, I there, forget. I hate cleaning I, ARs. I've seen... <laughs> Right, because like in a hunting application, you're not going to be shooting as much as like some of those guys who are running. I've seen some crazy shit. Well, y'all are. Where where, <laughs> where guns are just like, you're yes. like, how does it still work? Yes, I just, uh, I don't. The, but yeah, so the, the longer you wait, the, me, work, the harder yes. it is to clean. The, what keeps me like on a pretty regimen cleaning cycle. One, I shoot a lot too. Uh, I just I've let it get that bad before because it's AR. Ugh. Yeah, and cleaning it at that point is almost a all day ordeal. It is absolutely atrocious. And but again, like I said, you're, with the minute you screw a suppressor on, just clean it. And here's my little cleaning regimen while we're on it. If I'm using it quite a bit, that means I'm shooting it quite a bit that week, uh, in preparation for a hunt or what have you. Or if I'm just shooting a lot that week, after every little range session. I pull the boat carrier group out, the charge handle out. I wipe them down, relube them. And out here, I don't run, I don't run a lot of lube because it's typically pretty dusty out here most of the time. So I don't run a lot of lube. I run pretty dry. And that's another reason why I keep mine relatively more clean. And I go ahead and wipe down the inside of the upper and lower, and all that stuff. Keep that, keep that cleaned off. Keep that kind of lubed. Again, I don't run a lot because of the dust. And then that's you know, obviously, I clean my optics. Yeah, we have, a, we, we have a very interesting problem out here, which is a very fine dust that permeates uh, everything in the wind. and the, Yeah, you know. I mean, that well, that causes, like, all my bolt actions, there's just the most minute amount of grease on the bolt lugs, and that's absolutely it. Yeah. And it's not, you can't even see it it's so minute, because if you run any more, especially on these higher dollar actions that don't have a lot of tolerances and clearance and stuff, it's going to gunk up. It's All you're going to do is be pushing that shit up in there into where the bolt face yeah. Same thing can be said for an AR-15 is I run mine a lot, a lot drier. And it, what it does essentially is it requires you to clean it more, but I also I clean it more anyways because it's, it's nothing to pull that bolt carrier charge handle out, wipe down the inside of the action. I'm going to call it the action, upper and lower, and wipe down the bolt carrier group. That's nothing. And then, like, depending on the caliber, I'll do a barrel clean there once in a while. And I mean, I hate that. But Enough of the is. cleaning talk. It's so boring. Ugh, cleaning it's guns. a tool. Cleaning guns. Ugh. If if you want it to take care of you, you take care of it. It's that simple. Uh, so I mean, wh- where to next? Well, okay, we were we were we were verging towards, and this is where all kind of the, it seems from my perspective, all the development on AR fifteen stuffs happening right now is as it pertains to the t- tuning a gun, quote unquote. Yeah, and it all again it all has to do with that that gas system, right? That gas coming back in. And there's a couple different ways and approaches you can do it. Obviously, you know, we're big proponents of ammo first. So, like, feed yeah. clean ammo into the gun. It's going to make your job a lot easier. Yep. And that's why we we specifically have loads developed for suppressed, right? Particularly sh- suppressed short barrel rifles. Because um, that's, you know, again, shooting a shorter rifle, right? You're using full power ammunition designed for longer barrels on a shorter rifle. You're going to have more gas. It's, so, that's a problem that compounds. Um, but from there... You know, when that's really what you're going to start seeing with qual- more quality components is uh, typically smaller gas port sizes. Um, so you're not, you're not feeding, you, you hear overgassed and a lot of the, like your military, my, my combat guns, they're going to be overgassed, right? Because their worst case scenario is the gun doesn't cycle. Yeah. Um, versus 
you know, trying to tune this. It's kind of like a car, right? Do you want a, a car that can get you anywhere under any circumstances, or do you want a car that's going to, you know, feel nice to drive? Yeah. You know what you're going to be, sh- you know what ammo you're going to be shooting. You don't have to worry about cycling cheap, shitty ammo. And so you go gap, gas port first, um, quality barrels. Typically, you're going to have smaller gas ports. Um, but from there, um, you have the entire back end, which is the really the buffer and the buffer weight system. Yeah, and this is something. <coughs> this is a a long road I've been traveling down here recently. It's like getting in more into research side. Calm of down, thing. Leon Bridges. Because there's so much shit available now. It, it is. Generally yeah, speaking, we're gonna uh, deep dive this more this summer. Yeah, we by we, the way. we wanna we wanna because you know we're there's a lot of information out there on this. Um, you know, I'm more of a team. I'm, I'm hands on. I want to like do it myself to see, especially because we're kind of approaching it from a different angle anyway. Um, but generally speaking, the something like a you have all these different buffer systems. You can just get different buffer <laughs> weight. Let's go. Yeah, it's it's a thing. I mean, let's go wait. Like, don't get. This is another great reason just to buy an already completed firearm. Yeah. Because this could be like the death of you going down this road. The buffer tube links, buffer weights, the buffers. Yeah. And like all the, like it's a whole thing nowadays. Well, to, to sum it up as, as easily as possible, right? If you have a heavier buffer, think about what that's going to do. It's going to, essentially what you're trying to do is slow down or optimize the timing of the bolt coming back, releasing, which is what's going to vent that gas. Because a lot of your gas, uh, a lot of people think it's all coming from the gas tube when it's actually not. A lot of it's whenever your the lugs in your bolt unlock in the chamber and that bolt comes back. That's where a lot of the gas is coming from. Yeah. Uh, down from the barrel. So barrel in your chamber. So if you can slow that down, so heavy, like by tuning the, the, the you know, the strength of the spring along with the, the weight of the buffer, you can get it to where it's more optimal for whatever you're shooting. As two things, less blowback, but also you can change the recoil impulse. Yes. That, that's the, for me, the little bit I've started messing with them. That's the biggest thing for me. It's like, if you get, okay, I tend to just go with like, it, this shit works and that's where yeah. I kind of stay. But when, as I dove down, like the buffer weights and stuff like that, you can really tune them to where there's a way different recoil impulse. And that may affect your actually, or is it actually, or just all of it, <laughs> just all of it actually in uh precision, uh, it just, Again, it it changes like when you go to mess with those weights and don't, you know, keep in mind, you could totally mess up your system by changing out just a single weight. Yeah. But if you can really, that's where you start like fine tuning the recoil impulse and the feel of it. But again, you introduce the suppressor, introduces more back pressure. A lot of people start, I would say they probably typically start with the buffer weights or the buffer length system. Well, you do, you do and you don't because, uh, like whatever uh, here's what most people do if yeah if they're good like if they're de- if they're base level decent they'll google like what should i be running for this setup um most people if you're if you're approaching tuning it you should probably i would say the smart way is buffer first and then and then you start messing with your gas port so if that that's that's in the case of having an adjustable gas plug um now Again, we don't, we're not going to deep dive this, but where I would point you to is stuff like the Voltor A5 buffer system. That seems to be the best way to go. And that is okay. So you you get a it's a that's lo- pretty highly it's about the same opinion a lot of people have as it pertains. To yeah, kind of where it's where everybody settled. So it's a little bit longer, uh, but particularly the way that like you know you have this bu- I mean literally the buffer that it has these like uh, usually like tungsten weights inside of it thing about the uh the the voltor a5 is there springs in between those and springs on the end so it kind of it just slows that time down just a little bit more and you know what is a slow and smooth it's kind of the same concept you know right. uh now technically where that's going to affect you is like your cyclic rate but we're not shooting machine guns here right. i mean y'all aren't um uh it doesn't well matter. i mean so do you even recommend an adjustable gas block i don't like them all i the don't time. either it's for me Cause like if you've ever taken one apart, I hate like set screws in general and like set screws. I'm like the most important part of your gun. I've also launched. The, so like they'll typically have like a set screw, maybe like a jet. I've launched one of those down range and had to go like track it before. And I'm, I mean, we're talking something that's like, 
microscopic. To me, okay, if you look at uh, going back real fast to where the part about the gas in the barrel. Yeah. If you need proof of where most of the majority of the gas is coming from. Magazine. Look at your rifle. Uh, after you've shot, really the real test, throw on some like factory Hornady or, you know, Winchester, whatever, like just the shit that's made to run. It's not made to run nicely. Uh, Hornady 68 grain yeah. frontier. That's like the gassiest shit that I've yeah. ever seen. So shot. stick that in, run several magazines, then look at your magazine and then pull your charge handle and everything like pull your, uh, boat carrier group charge handle out and look at where majority of the black suit is. It's right there. In the uh, what do they call it barrel extension? Yeah, barrel extension area down to your magazine. Like most of the crud is right there. It's not well. Most the, of the crud is up higher and further back. It's right there on in the, that barrel. Space. On the bolt carrier, there's three little. Those are the three. I think it's three dots. That's made to vent the excess gas out. Yeah, from the from the uh, BCG. The, the gas coming from the from the yeah. gas tube. So yeah, it's here's the deal. If you really because, right, like, you're not going to be able to really, like, tune the gas port. Like, it's like you can really change that. I mean, you're, like, you can order different barrels that are going to have smaller gas ports, and if right. you know that from the outset. So, like, that can give you a final level of control. In an ideal world, though, I wouldn't want that to be adjustable. I don't, you know, I don't, typically, I like more compact handguards. Yeah. And a lot of times, some of these... I mean, they have some nowadays that are pretty compact, but most, a lot of times you can get a more compact handguard. I think the, the two most popular it. are superlative arms. That's what I was about and to say. The old ones that I used to use back in the day were Cirac. I know the uh, the twins, they have superlative. And right off the bat, just through two random suppressors, which they are new suppressors, they shoot fantastic. Yeah. Like, great recoil impulse and everything else. So maybe I'm going to take a look at adjustable gas blocks a little bit. But, I mean, I look at it from this situation is i don't like messing with nothing on that end like messing with the boat carrier my first stop typically is the adjustable boat carrier but since we've come out with our optimized ammo i don't even have to mess with that anymore yeah i then then it's just the buffer i mean sometimes i you know here's the problem with adjustability is it's just like too many options right yeah and i I mean literally you can adjust anything nowadays (laughs) pre really dialing in the ammo i was all about the adjustable boat carrier that really that really fixed the situation for me but now that we got the optimized ammo you don't even need the adjustable boat carrier and i don't even fo- typically fool with any adjustable gas blocks i just stick with uh we're, again we're going to go down this road of the buffer system and stuff like that this summer because what i'm looking for at this point like all my stuff runs really well what I'm looking for at this point is like, what can this do as far as changing the recoil impulse is where, I, where I'm kind of looking towards. Uh, yeah. It, like some of mine are like, they're tuned up and running really well, but I've got like a, to keep weight down. Like I stripped everything down to like the bare bones, like the smallest buffer I can run and all that stuff. I want, and it's a little bit like, eh, you know, I want it a little bit quieter and a little bit more tuned. Yeah. So that's the only reason why I'm kind of going down that road. But I mean, there's, eons of videos on youtube about buffer systems to understand okay before you do anything you just need to understand what buffer system what buffer tubes and all that stuff like you need to know the the bare essentials to that regardless and and all of this is why i really like buying factory rifles exactly (laughs) let's just go back to uh a lot of these rifles already completed or like they'll have like specific setups to where they've already done all this work they know it works (laughs) <laughs> but take, particularly with the various calibers, right? So you have and that's and that's where getting in this next part is the biggest pain is trying to shoot like non-standard calibers from ARs, yeah. whether it be the AR tens or the we're sticking to AR fifteens. But uh, yeah, because you, you know s- you start wildcatting, uh, just be ready. Like there could be some issues. I mean that's that's all there is to it. There could be a few issues getting it getting it like tuned up and all that stuff. And just don't go too far in the weeds when you're just getting started. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And in terms of alternative caliber AR 15s, I think our most recommended one is uh, you have experience with is DNA firearms. Yeah. 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 So we we didn't touch on them earlier. Like, well, yeah. So like, so what you get is all the way down to 
cheap platforms. I'm just going to go ahead and list off a few like Ruger, uh, PSA. Um, uh, we said it earlier, Springfield. Like your bottom, uh, you know, factory stock rifles. Yeah. Uh, and then you get up into like my next category, and this is just all opinion based, is like your upper end factory stock style rifles which would be like the geisley and the whiskey and stuff like that like you're also like with some of these you're you're pushing on the boundary of a custom yeah like it's it's a factory custom essentially is what i'd call it and then you get your full custom manufacturers and i know there's another one out of arizona but i cannot remember their name my apologies but i know of dna and they they do a lot of just straight custom platforms and then they're a great place to look for like a six arc one in 10 twist, like a, a straight custom varmint setup. And it's, you know, it's uh typically they're going to be milled receiver sets, not, not forged. Uh, they're typically going to have some sort of like highly custom barrel length or twist or, you know, custom calibers and stuff like that. So if that kind of stuff excites you, uh, that's the route I would go with that. Me, me personally. <laughs> yeah. It's the alternate caliber stuff. That's where, you know, it can get tricky. It can get tricky. So you have obviously two twenty three five five six. That's what ARs were designed around. That's, that's what they use. Um, you have other calibers, which are pretty popular. So keep in mind when you, when you, just because something can be chambered in an AR doesn't mean it runs good in an AR. So this right. is what you, <laughs> yeah. uh, this is where Absolutely. you get into, um, I think the next step up from that that's the most popular is 300 blackout. Again, this is a round that was designed to function in AR, semi-automatic, short-barreled, supersonic, subsonic. It's 300 blackout's a great option for very specific circumstances. Yeah. It's not you're not shooting long range with it. No. I, mean, I have. Yeah. You, <laughs> you can actually you can actually there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of arc in it. You can have a lot of fun with a 300 blackout and a bolt gun. Loan some super heavies. It's it's a it's I would compare it to uh maxing out the potential of the twenty two long rifle. It's kind of the same scenario. Yeah. Like, yeah. like you you're not you're essentially not shooting long range, you're calling it ordinance at long <laughs> range. And you better have like a lot of travel in the scope and like it, but it's fun. Yeah. Uh but I think where the three hundred blackout really shines is close quarters type stuff and whether it be home defense or close quarters pig shooting or close quarters couch shooting with the one ten V maxes. Yeah, it's uh for me I wouldn't own a longer barrel. I short barreled suppressed. Yeah. Uh, no. When I want something that's manageable or quiet. Um, you know, obviously we have our we have our ammo selection available. Yeah. And a lot of and another popular one is the discrete ballistics for the yeah. sub the subsonic stuff. They have like their crazy. They do a lot of the like uh, solids and stuff like yeah. that. Like that's their big thing. So that's another great option if you're shooting subsonic. Um but that's probably the most popular. It's a very specific niche. Like yeah. that's where we I use it for home defense, you use it for home defense. And, you know, and a lot of people But we also have other rifles, so if you come at us, uh just know that we have we have out to fifteen hundred covered. <laughs> so don't a lot like, of people a lot of people jumped on as it pertains to the hunting community, a lot of people jumped on it when the tactical community kind of made it super popular. Yeah. And then they quickly got out of it because they're there's limitations. Limitations. And that 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 goes across the board. There's limitations to all these calibers. Three hour blackout, hundred yards and in. That's where I'm staying. And that's with supers a hundred yards. Subs yeah. and we're I'm talking strictly hunting and well, if someone's in my house subs i'm sticking even closer especially as it pertains to pigs yeah your drop with subs is a lot ridiculous particularly if you're shooting you know an eight inch or shorter barrel um, yeah. which a lot of people are and that, i mean again that's what that now i did develop a deer hunting load for the 16 inch bolt guns and it's specifically for that this yeah. is not for an ar-15 platform but the, if you look at the three iron blackout cartridge case capacity projectiles all that stuff. It's really at home in a shorter barrel suppressed platform. That's literally what it is developed for. Use it and don't expect too much out of the platform. If you use it within the confines of what it's really meant to do, it's fantastic. It's fun. Yeah. And it's super quiet. So, when you, run subs. you know, moving on from there and, you know, and we're talking about these calibers, I'm talking about stuff that's specifically developed for the AR-15. Yeah. Um, I think the, the third most popular is probably 6.5 Grendel. 
Wait. What was number two? Three and a blackout. What was number one? Two twenty three five five six. You never even mentioned that. I did. You did. I said, obviously, it's the most pop, uh, most oh, popular. Well, we need to talk about that for a minute. Do we? Yeah, oh, we'll talk about it. It's two twenty. Everybody know. Like, does anybody not know twenty twenty three five five six? Yes, but there's some it, back to what I was saying about the three hundred blackout. A lot of people. This will shy people away from the AR fl- platform because they'll get one of two twenty three. 16 inch barrel. Well, you know that 223 was designed to wound <laughs> on impact that way. You know, the, 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 the Charlie, they'd have to carry out their friend and it would take two men down instead of one. So, uh, 223 was designed. To, so, it wasn't designed to kill, it was designed to wound. A lot of people will get one and they'll, they'll, uh, you know, put shitty shots on animals and then they're like, oh, it's 223 is a terrible caliber. It's your shot placement more than anything. Uh, it's super handy up to, I'm going to say up to whatever length bro you feel like carrying, which I like mine in the shorter configurations. Cause if I, I want something that's more long range capable, I'll probably reach for a larger caliber, like the Valkyrie or the arc. The two twenty three strength is in its ubiquity, which kind of goes back to that argument we were talking about with three Oh eight earlier. The difference with two twenty three is it's, it'll always be cheap. It'll always be available. You're always going to have a huge variety of ammunition types. You can get yes. it anywhere. Yes. You can do a lot with it. You're not going to burn the barrel out. Great for, great for pigs, coyotes, fox, bobcat. Lots and lots of options on projectiles. Yes, if you're used to shooting 308 and shooting them in a big metal, the 223 yeah. isn't going to be that deadly. Your shot placement does matter, and that's yeah. where I see a lot of people shy away from the 223, or they try to push it beyond its its capabilities. Yeah. And that's totally by barrel length, velocity, and projectile weight. And we covered that some in the... Well, yeah, we've, we've touched on that a lot. I'm not so. going to jump into it. I'm just going to say my favorite setup for a 223 is 16 inch and down. Uh, I couldn't imagine having anything longer. I've got the one Daniel Defense 18 inch. Yeah, Mark 12. That I'm so upset about, I haven't even gotten it back out. <clears throat> it shoots like gar- hot garbage. Just put a six arc barrel in it. I'm Don't definitely going to pull the barrel and then probably ask for. Cause I want, I want to see if their 18 inch barrel is going to pan out. I want an 18 inch that shoots really well for like long range. I know you had a lot of hell working up that load, and it and it ended up being more of the rifle because I I ended up putting it through a bunch of different 16 inches and it was fantastic. Yeah, uh, but anyways, I it's okay. 223, 16 coming. inch and down. On barrel length. Everybody knows everything about 223. And I really like the the 14 inch area. Yeah, that's that 14. For 223. 13.7's gotten popular because oh, you can yeah. pin and weld yeah. the muzzle device and have a shorter gun that's not a SBR. I don't, I, I think overall, I tend to trend towards an 11.5, but I, that 12.5 length's really cool. Just, oh. In terms of like a do it all rifle, I mean, less hunting focused, but like if you were going to have one rifle. Right. It's just short enough to be short, just long enough to be long. I, don't, um, I really they, like, they, they shoot really well too. As it pertains to projectile velocities and flat so that's out all to that, whatever. That's all that important stuff. I don't know who cares about that. <laughs> uh, I really like, okay, so take for instance our uh, 52 grain Botella points. Out of a 14.5, it's still going 3,000 feet per second. Out of a 16 inch, you're at 3,200. And that's almost perfect for most barber hunting. Yeah. With a 52. Now, if you're going to be running this as a short range only, 100% stick up to step up to the 68s. Well, the 60s, 68s, they're fantastic for a short range Kyle rig and can be used for home defense. It's fantastic, and that's where that like crossover <clears throat> platform really comes in. I'm going to say 300 blackout, 223. Yeah, and those those are those are what we consider common calibers. You generally don't. Typically, it's good practice to run different mags in your 300 blackout that way because there is potential you could kaboom. Like, if you mix your 223s into 300s, you could have a bad day. Yeah. Um, but that's like, generally speaking, those are going to work. You're not going to have any issues. You don't really have to worry about tuning as much. Uh, it's going to be fine. Ammo is typically pretty available. Yeah. Is it the best ammo? Not always. But you're going to be able to find ammo. Yeah. So from there, I think third most popular. And I don't know this for a fact, but I would assume 6.5 Grendel, particularly in the hunting community. I'd say probably. Yeah. Uh, so if currently, if, well, yeah, in the, <laughs> this is a whole thing. Um, 6.5 Grendel was, it started in 
so if, if you're familiar with calibers, if you've ever heard of six PPC, it's uh, it was ahead of its time. <laughs> um, essentially what somebody was wanting to do is, is, uh, have an AR chambered and they basically did the six, five PPC, which later became six, five Grendel, um, which was, they noticed that a lot of the higher BC bullets at the time, the overall length on the six fives were, were shorter because they were wider. So what they were able to do is fit it in a, in a standard AR magazine. They didn't have to worry about seating the bullet too deep. Mm hmm. Uh, and so six five Grendel started, and it was all competition shooting. And then, I uh, thought they originally developed that with the. Uh, wait, no, I'm getting things crossed. Never mind. Well, so scratch that. Well, so this was a competition shooter, and this was particularly the six five PPC, quote unquote, which was like when the six P. You had the twenty two P uh, PPC and the six PPC. They were like there was known quantities. The six five PPC was kind of like talked about, but nobody ever did it. This person did it, and then worked with uh was it Bill, Bill Alexander and Alexander yeah. Arms? Um, and then they kind of came together and essentially created the, the the six five Grendel, which is so basically it's the it's a larger bolt face, but it's still AR fifteen platform. Yeah, for those who don't know, larger bolt face, still AR fifteen platform, and what it allows you to do is take that six point five millimeter projectile in a hundred twenty three grain weight. Which gives you typically you're going to be looking at a at least a point five G one BC, which is kind of like the the standard for a long range cartridge. Like it's typically when you get to at least a point five, you're going to be able to uh, stay uh, above transonic out to a thousand yards at least. And yeah, and that was this cartridge like was designed to be a you know long range AR fifteen where you didn't have to modify the gun or the magazines to. to I work. think they uh, said it was going to be a three hundred eight killer. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's what they were telling. Literally me. everything is. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, well, they were toting at the time. I remember they were toting like when it really got popular. They were toting that it was. It, it, I like how used to everything was just, it's better than a 308 <laughs> as far yeah. as ballistics go, yeah. which is literally everything. <laughs> right. Yeah. We, we know that now, but yeah. uh, yeah. So the big deal with, I mean, it's been around 20 years. It's, it's fairly old cartridge. That, that new fangled, you know, they were really going after the Yeah. Right. The, the military stuff. And it's, it's a fantastic option, especially um, a lot of hog hunters, like a lot it. of hog hunters and a lot of, a lot of deer hunters run it. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of people running out of short barrels too down to yeah, a lot of people yeah. like that 12, five length. Although typically you see longer. Yeah. Um, now, well, I mean, mo most of your factory available raffles are going to be longer, but a lot of people have these home builders stuff. They really start building like 12 fives and so, so on and so forth. But like 18 inch is going to be pretty, pretty common. Uh, it's, uh, 123 grain EODM kill just about anything you pointed at. I mean, yeah, within reason, don't be ridiculous. The, <laughs> the it's, it's interesting cause it's, it's very popular in certain communities, but then most people don't really know much about it. Um, yeah. one of the big advantages over some of the others over the one we're about to talk about is, uh, well, I guess no, we'll probably talk about 224 next. Yeah. Even though it's not going to be the fourth most popular. Um, but, is they they had steel cased ammo available for the six five Grendel, so you could actually shoot it pretty decently cheap. Yeah, um, and then long, I mean, long range performance. It's pretty yeah. good. Yeah, because that high BC six point five millimeter projectile holds on to its velocity longer. Yep, that's that's the that's the whole thing nowadays. Is like everybody wants to shoot their AR fifteens further. So. Yeah. Well. Let's we'll, we'll get we'll we'll touch on two twenty four last. I want to touch on six. I was it's, it's very natural. Well, to go we, from. we really are about to miss a super popular one. That's twenty two nozzler. Okay, let's, well let's do, we'll do two. I would I we'll would do twenty two nozzler and two twenty four Valkyrie. I bet separate. I bet they're right there. And as far as popularity, I bet they're pretty negative. Yeah. Right. So let's do well because a lot of what we just talked about is going to apply to the six arc. So uh, from from everything that's available online. So uh, Hornady was working with a certain subset of the DOD on a special project. And essentially what happened is they were, uh, they, they noticed in uh, Afghanistan, essentially the, the enemy was just far enough away. They were getting outside their effective range of the use of the AR-15s. And, uh, you know, 
they they really couldn't do anything. And right, you know, these guys are shooting old Russian PKMs and stuff. They can they can outrange the hell out of everybody. So they started carrying you know three oh eights, but then you get all the downsides of carrying three oh eights or any kind of big big bore. You know, on average, I think they say it's a thirty percent weight increase overall. Yeah. And uh, so they started testing the six five Grendel. You know, they were they took him out there and it's like you know. Let's we'll do some courses and we'll test it and everybody really liked that and then uh, I guess there was certain terminal performance they didn't like out of the six five uh, six five Grendel I think it was more of the close range stuff if I, if I recall yeah. correctly um, and then now you know twenty years later six, the six caliber is just obviously incredibly popular because you get that even less recoil you get the crazy high BC bullets there's a bunch of new bullets on the market yeah Hornady is you know. Hornady's become what they are, and they were working specifically with them. So they have eventually wound up developing the six arc, which is essentially a six five Grendel, brought back down to six caliber. So it's like We've kind of an evolution of the evolution. original. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's kind of like the original six PPC. Well, I mean, as projectiles get better and higher BC and everything, like you you make these loops and all this other stuff, it just kind of makes you wonder, like, what's next? Twenty five arc or some shit like yeah. what's, you know well that's what everybody everybody gets mad about it they're like well we already did this and the six five grundle was better but it's like yeah but now we have 20 more years of yeah. information uh, and powder development, development. well powder development being the biggest one right uh and then projectile development so yeah six arc released two years ago it kind of got stunted by covid it was designed around an 18 inch barrel um and yeah we'll see what they did was and you'll have to go to the horny podcast to get the full story to get the exact story was they took whatever this platform was in 308 and they wanted the length to be a certain amount in an AR-15 platform. So they basically designed it around it being, I think, what was it, 30% lighter yeah. and the same length as this whatever AR-10 platform. And they, you know, they say it on that podcast. So what they end up with is this perfect 18-inch platform that was way lighter, but way more capable yeah. than 308, essentially. So, but this applies to well, really the the Grendel, the Ark, and the Valkyrie. Uh, more of the Ark and the Valkyrie, but we'll throw the Grendel in there. And probably 6.8 SPC, but whatever. Those cartridge uh, capacities yield themselves to great performance in shorter barrels. Yeah. And then their projectiles and everything else. Like it's, they're just fantastic shorter barrel performers, essentially. I mean, well, cause you have, at the end of the day, you have a more efficient cartridge design. Yeah. So, and so, I mean, so keep in mind the six arc wasn't developed to be a 12 inch dump mags into berms type setup. Because if you buy factory ammo, that shit, it, it's, it is what it is. It's factory ammo. It's going to be super gassy because it's it's ultimately developed for an 18-inch barrel. Yeah, and you see most of the factory loads, it's like what, 108, 106, 103. Yep. Um, well, that's pretty, kind of that. well, there's 105, 103, 106, 108. Yeah. 105, 103, 106, 108. And that's yes. kind of the biggest thing, and I think it's a problem Currently. with the COVID, is like the ammo that they initially released, that's kind of what's out there now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I mean, just like all things Horny does is they think they have like one thing and everybody and they, else goes, no, nope, we're using it for this now. Exactly. And they don't, what they seem somehow, like it's repeatedly happened for certain things. Ultimately the hunting community is much larger than the PRS or whatever community. Like there's way more hunters or way more hunting platforms. And what ultimately happens is these new fangled cartridges <laughs> Yeah, get adopted heavily by hunting communities and then they'll catch up and start coming out with more hunting ammo that's more specifically for shorter barrels and you know well, stuff yeah, like because i think the, the the 103 the precision hunter that's more recent isn't it that's probably their newest one yeah. 103 like a, a deer hunting load yeah uh, quote so unquote. and you know we we plan on having a podcast pretty soon we're going to deep dive the six arc yes but in general the next podcast. are we going to do it the very next one yeah that's why I wanted to do this one. Okay, cool. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it's it's a really efficient cartridge that's good out of, you know, you really even like it out of the 14.5. The 14, okay, 
I would probably wouldn't go any shorter than fourteen five. Well, you're about to get to test a twelve five. So, uh, I mean, it's still there's still plenty of people that are ringing still out to a thousand yards out of twelve fives all day long. Yeah, but as far as a semi auto platform, like it's it's perfect. Really, at home at a sixteen inch, fourteen five is still very doable. It's a little bit tougher to really get those optimized lows. I was saying it makes sense because if a Hornady, Hornady optimized it around an 18 inch, you kind of playing around with it. It makes sense that you could like maximize that out of a 16, right? Because you're getting the better performance. When you um, 14 five gets a little bit tougher, but then when you step down to 12 five, I, I bet it's it's just going to be in an AR 15 platform. It's going to be gassy no matter what you do in a 12 five. Oh, that's my big thing is uh, I, I haven't decided what suppressor I'm going to go with that. Because there was a specific one they developed for Six Arc, but they haven't released yet. I would probably, and I am not a proponent of flow through style suppressors, yeah. but I would probably either build a piston gun, <laughs> and we didn't even touch on that earlier. But most people ain't going to get one for hunting, but or a more flow through yeah. type design. Because I mean, like I said, fourteen five is like right on the cusp of all I can do with current powder technologies. Yeah. Like I've got some really good loads, but they're still a little bit like, eh, whereas a 16 is like really freaking nice. And obviously the 18 and you know, further up. But I mean, if it's a bolt gun, it doesn't make a shit. Yeah. Just saying. But anyway, we'll, we'll get into that more on the next one. Yeah. yeah that's so uh, the reason why we wanted to start with the semi auto hunting platform is to just caveat into the deep dive of the six R. Cause I mean, but because lately, 90% of people are using it wrong. Yes, it's the reality. Here lately, a lot of people have been messaging me about six arcs. Like it because of its performance, especially from a varmint hunting thermal yeah. standpoint. A lot of people are getting into it, and I'll tell you another thing is it's gotten super popular as a white tail cartridge. Super popular, especially if you consider recoil. <laughs> yeah, into the aspect and the six millimeter projectiles, you can load all the way up if you want to, all the way up to one hundred ten grain. Uh, there's been for millennia people killing whitetail with two forty threes, which is a, just a six millimeter projectile. Because it's super efficient, it achieves the velocities needed to kill a deer out to technically several hundred yards. But most people are shooting within two hundred. It'll do that all day long. So it's gotten super popular. I've been filling lots of questions about, it, especially semi-auto platforms, which I guess I've become a a bit of a proponent for the shorter barrel six millimeter arc. Yeah, yeah, it's great. I mean, well, I mean, uh, just quickly touching on it, like my fourteen five, I run fifty eights at thirty one hundred feet per second, and that's that's with my LPVO one to ten on there. Super handy. I mean, it's just freaking handy. That's all there is to it. Super lightweight, super small and agile. Uh, I really like it. And then I could turn around and put one my one oh five burgers in it that are still running. Oh, I can't remember now. Twenty five fifty or twenty six hundred. If you go based off velocity and everything else, I could still kill a white tail out to at least six hundred yards, which I'm going to do with a fourteen five. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Twenty two nozzler. Twenty two nozzler. Uh, so leave it to nozzler to just develop a cartridge that has maximum case capacity, but for minimal projectiles. <laughs> like you know, it's. Twenty-two dollars is one hundred percent a varmint hunter's cartridge. If you look at cartridge overall length that still fits in a standard AR fifteen magazine, you are going to be topped out at a certain weight projectile, and that that's also due to how how they're manufactured. Most of your high BC twenty-two cal projectiles, you are not going to be able to get them bad boys in the twenty-two nozzler because of cartridge overall length. Uh, you're going to be topped out generally around that 77 grain. And not all 77 grain projectiles are going to fit in that properly to fit in an AR-15 magazine. But as a varmint caliber that yields itself pretty good to 16, 18 inch and longer barrels, it's basically a step up over the 223. Like it's a little bit faster hot rod. The, the, other thing, the real thing I like about the Osler cartridges is they all... And they have the 24 nozzler, which we need to slightly speak on. They all use the standard bolt face, which is good. Now, there are some people do have some issues with that uh, 
big old fat cartridge going down to a standard two two three bolt face, but I haven't had any issues out of it. That's just me. But uh you're looking at a slight edge over the two twenty three. And if you hand load or get into a bolt gun, you can pick up a pretty good increase over two twenty three. And still, it's going to be more optimal for like those 55, 53, 52, and 50 grain projectiles as far as cartridge overall length and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and like I said, if you can still find a platform available, which I don't think you can nowadays, uh, it's going to probably going to be 18 inch barrel. And that's where it really fi- finds a good home is a 16, 18 inch when you consider cartridge overall, overall length and, you know, powder burn rates and so on and so forth. Like I said, it was really, it's really a varmint hunting cartridge, uh, but you can shoot. Like I know Nosler has a seventy-seven RDF load, which is, I think it's the RDF. I think so. It's a pretty high BC twenty-two cal projectile, like super high BC, and it still feeds out an AR fifteen magazine. Pretty high performer. Like that'll outperform your know, your standard seventy-seven TMKs or whatever they are in the Sierra that everybody loves. Our special purpose ammo is 77 rds which is fantastic but anyways i digress uh not a lot to be said there i mean uh there's a lot of people that use it still in the uh 50 55 grain range which currently i'm working on a 53 grain v max load for that one so that ought to be pretty cool let's move to one of my favorites which is the valkyrie boo (laughs) it did not get its fair shake because a shitty company came out with it i'm just saying it sh- to me in my personal opinion uh if you do want a high performer in that 10 11 12 inch barrel category the perfect cartridge for that is the valkyrie or this other one i'm working on we'll talk about that later uh but the problem with it is nobody makes a freaking short barrel you probably have to cut you can probably custom order so yeah but if you look at especially if you hand load uh you look at the cartridge capacity and the overall length and obviously on a if you're going to be shooting people or engaging longer range targets the higher bc heavier projectiles are ideal that's what the valkyrie is kind of all about a shorter fatter cartridge that can still run the higher longer bc projectiles than a 223 or 556 if you look at cartridge case capacity, like I said, overall length of the cartridge allowed in the AR-15 magazine, that cartridge would be awesome in a short barrel. Now, you probably couldn't go get fantastic results out of factory ammo because it's more uh, better for longer barrels. But if you're a hand loader, totally doable. Now, that is a pretty highly popular varmint hunting cartridge like it that's pretty much probably the only people still run in i don't you know i follow all the groups there's still people deer hunting with them hog hunting with them still people long range planking but because it didn't you know we covered that in different podcasts it didn't get its fair shake in court <laughs> uh it's still super popular in the varming hunting varmint hunting community especially the thermal guys most of those guys are running 60 grainers uh there's still rifles available uh i just i wish I wish it would get its fair shake and get adopted into shorter barrel platforms or slower twists. So it'd be more specifically for varmint hunting because what I found, especially in a boat gun atmosphere is I could scare the shit out of 22 to 50 velocities with that tiny cartridge. Now that would be a boat gun only type situation. But if you, if you went to the drawing board and redesigned the available offerings where it like barrel length and all that stuff i think that cartridge would really find its home in a 10 11 12 up to a 16 inch i wouldn't go any longer my personal opinion it would really find its home there especially with the right powders uh you could take you could take a, a 16 inch rifle pin it against a 16 inch 223 and just walk off from it all day long especially if you're running like the 75s all the way up to the 88s and again I prefer it. Currently, my favorite offering is one of the twins, and it's a 16 inch. And we'll talk about ammo at a later date because it's it's some uh, it's some super top secret stuff going on. <laughs> Just saying, I've I've basically managed 
I'm I'm just gonna stop. I'm not gonna tell you more because like I, I basically I come out with a even better Valkyrie load than we already have. But anyways, I mean I'm I'm not gonna spend any more time because again Valkyrie kind of got a shitty end of the deal. It's still out there, still popular. But I, I think at this point, six arcs already overtaken it. Yeah, and I think it's going to. I've like hopefully. Oh, gee. here's here's the two things that needs to happen: is a uh, Hornady needs to get their shit together, release, drop a drop a, a load of brass and new at this offerings at this shop. <laughs> yeah, specifically all the brass because we okay. And, and then Starline needs to pull their heads out of their ass and get some six arc brass. That'd going. be nice. And then. Because then, then, then you'd see. I'd seen so many people talking about like I'm wait, I'm waiting to get one, just waiting on components. Alpha, make the six arc brass. Oh, Alpha, we love you. <laughs> and don't forget, folks, twenty two Creed is coming. It's official. Yeah. Are we gonna do a, a pre order? We're still looking at a oh. week and a half. Oh, right, let's let's get it in hand first, least. and then maybe. I think we should, but a very limited number. <sighs> On the 75 grain ELDMs. If we could have like a. Very. Once we get everything in hand and like figure it out, we can figure out like what the timeline is and we're like a guaranteed ship date. Right. That'd be the way to do it. But I, I still say, again, well, the brass will probably be here by the end of the week. I mean, that's it is what it is. Uh, and we're going to, you know, <clears throat> load work's already done on the, the ones I know we have. Yeah. Good to go, so we're gonna start manufacturing soon as here. Uh, but like I said, that's not the that's not the point of this podcast. The point of this podcast is you should reach out to Alpha Hornady Starline everybody. Let's let's get some six arc brass going. If we would just get some components out there, some loaded ammo out there, you would really watch that cartridge take off. And uh, guess what, people? The six arc isn't for mag dumping in the fifty yard barbs. <laughs> that's not what it's intended for. I guess you could use it for that if you want to. But we did all this just so we can caveat into next week's podcast, which is another highly asked for topic, and that's the six arc. It's why why everything you know about six arc is wrong. <laughs> is, that, is that what we title it? And it, I'm gonna try and do it. I've already got a bunch of data. There's still, I mean, it's nowhere near where we need to be, but for a book, but. There's already a bunch of data. We can already kind of steer you down the right direction and choosing barrel links and platforms and so on and so forth. So, again, I think this was just a good place to start as far as AR-15 platforms for hunting. Uh, go go grab one. That's that's what I'm saying. Uh, it's Especially these newfangled cartridges have really changed my mind on how I feel about the... Again, it's all about performance. And... uh component availability has really driven me to running much more efficient cartridges. And then that kind of steered me into the AR-15 platform even heavier. Anything to add? Spay and neuter your cats, folks. <laughs> I was going to say, we went a little long. It's okay. It's fine. It's fine. Is that is that your... Your your ending thoughts are we went a little long. Yeah, we did go a little long. I don't know what it's going to wind up being, but we're like two and a half hours. Perfect. Eh. I'm going to cut it down a bit. Two episodes, whatever. I mean, you can almost your first rant about PRS shooters could nearly be its own podcast. I know. I just I I want to, and I didn't even get the same thing I wanted to say. On that. I was, <clears throat> yeah, I was. Yeah, I don't. Oh. Well, folks. Well, I you know. You know, now that I'm a PRS shooter, oh, I yes, have to. Of course, we're gonna have to cut it, cut it now because I have to go dry fire off a ladder <laughs> and get them reps in. Well, we'll see you next time, folks. <laughs>